This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. In this episode, I talk with vocalist, bassist, songwriter, and U.S. States Army Sergeant Corinne Campbell. And she talks to me about being a musician in a war zone, dealing with haters, and the practice of mindfulness. Enjoy this episode. Hey, it's James Taylor. I'm delighted today to have Karen Campbell. Karen is a vocalist, bassist, and songwriter with the band Dash 10, who is also an active duty soldier in the United States Army. As Sergeant Campbell, she is the only original music artist to be endorsed by a brand of the US military, and while deployed in Iraq with the 1st Cavalry Division, she would frequently travel by Black Hawk helicopters to entertain soldiers across the country. She is now employed as the featured artist with the US Army Musical Outreach Team and says... My army career fine-tuned me into a self-aware and objective musician. I learned to acknowledge my weaknesses so they could be strengthened. And it's my great pleasure to have you on the show today. Welcome to the show. Thank you, James. Thanks for having me. Well, first of all, I should say we're actually recording this today on Memorial Day, which is very apt, I think, as well. So first of all, I'd like to thank you for your, your service to your country as well. Oh, I appreciate that so much. So um, obviously, this is a big day. After, after, um, after you've kind of finished the interview today, do you have kind of um, events that you're going to after this? Well, I live in downtown Franklin, Tennessee currently, um, and they have parades and uh, various uh, activities and events downtown only a few blocks from me um, to kind of, you know, memorialize the day and the soldiers. Um, this has been a city where there has been a lot of um, civil war conflict in the, you know, in the not very recent past. And so um, there are battlefields and um, recreations of various battles of the Civil War to kind of keep those things in our minds. I think um, it's, it's especially excellent because I think, you know, um, the perils of war and, and what brings humans to a point of war, um, you know, to keep those things kind of present in our mind uh, as we look forward in the future and how to avoid those things. I think it's actually kind of good that we keep those, um, keep some mindfulness about it. So I'm very excited because this is a historic town. Um, and so for Memorial Day, they have a lot of things going on. That's beautiful. So first of all, share with our listeners, what's going on in your world just now? You're, you're, you're a very busy woman. Uh, so share with our listeners, <laughs> what, what, what's happening? What current projects do you have underway? Well, um, my primary function as a soldier is actually a tour playing music that I've written and recorded myself away from the army. Um, and I play that music at music festivals and high schools. And really the initiative is just to kind of open up the understanding and perspective of what military service is and how multifaceted it is, as well as, you know, just maintaining that individualism. I think many people think once you put on a uniform and you look alike that they're also trying to breed, you know, similarity between personalities and people. And uh, obviously that, especially if my job exists, that can't be true. (laughs) Um, and so that's that's kind of my main function um, as a soldier, and that's you know an incredibly unique opportunity for me in the U.S. Army, and and just kind of representing um, the creatives and artists as a whole um, as a member of service. I I think that that's especially valued to me because I you know I want people to just understand that there's more to the soldier than the uniform and war. So when you're at these these music festivals and you and you first, you know, some um, you know, folks come up to you and you know the 16, 17, 18, and uh, and then you tell them what you do and also you know the, the the these kind of these roles that you have as a musician, as an artist, and also as a serving um, a serving sergeant in the military as well. What are, what are some of their first responses to that? They're very weirded out. <laughs> um, not really. I mean, they're not weirded out, but it, it's definitely kind of a shake in their perspective, you know, especially if you're talking about early millennials and, and our late teenagers now. Um, you know, we have, as Americans, we've kind of been in this state of conflict pretty much their entire conscious life. 
And so the military has been represented on media in a, you know, a lot. So, and there's usually these polar representations of service members. So, you know, when there's military scandal or, you know, awareness about you know, sexual assault or, or these kind of negative connotations, um, these, you know, troublemakers are highlighted. And then the other side is this extreme martyrdom um, with, you know, and, and it is very, it's true. There are soldiers who lose everything, um, their lives, and there are soldiers who lose their limbs, lose their careers. And, um, you know, it, it is, definitely something that is factual. But those two polar examples are not the majority of service members. And so I think when, you know, these people come up to me, especially as a combat veteran who, you know, I, I did a year deployment, um, but I, you know, was grateful to come home intact and, um, and still be able to kind of represent how that experience built up a stronger person in me without, um, you know, feeling like I, I was compromised. I think it's, it's just difficult for them to understand that there is this, this medium existence of a soldier. You don't have to fall in these two polar categories. It's very accessible and human, and they're almost surprised by it. And when you're out uh, on deployment and whether you're in Iraq or, or another um, country as well, I mean, so I was watching a document documentary the other day. Um, it was, I think it was set in Afghanistan and it was up in one, a very kind of forward operating base. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the things I, I remember about watching this documentary was how there was someone there, it was very important for him to have his guitar um, yes. out there as well. So what, what role, what function does music have when you're at these kind of, those kind of places which, you, you know, you're, you're in the, almost in the firing line, or you're certainly in maybe bases which are a little bit, you know, closer to, to um, where harm could, could happen. So what, what role does music play there? I think that, you know, music is something that is organically a part of all of us. And, and some people are more music fans. And um, some people, you know, just like to listen to it more casually. But there is an element of us, I think, organically, just as as human beings that respond to the vibrations of of sonic waves of music coming into our eardrums, and it's a, just a huge piece of who we are. And you know, even anthropologically, as far as you go back, you know, music is a big piece of what brings those cultures together and what creates kind of an identity in those cultures. And so. I don't think it's any different um, when you're in a combat situation. My deployment was actually in Operation Iraqi Freedom 2. So that was in 2004, very early on. And um, there was a lot more conflict then. I was stationed just outside of Baghdad at a forward operating base called uh, Camp Victory. And that that was very close to a lot of action. And, and the reason why I was traveling via Blackhawk most of the time was because we were flying into remote locations within the city where small teams were operating out of. Uh, and you could see the the weight on their shoulders, you know, from from being involved in that kind of activity. And I think what we were offering them as we were traveling around the city was kind of a little piece of home playing music that they that they loved that was familiar that reminded them of of where they were before they were in this desert um and for me that was just ex incredibly fulfilling that I was doing something that I loved which is playing music but then also kind of serving my brothers who, and sisters who were doing more what I perceived as more difficult jobs um, in as far as service members are concerned. And, so, and that has a long tradition as well. I mean, I know obviously in, in the, the U.S. Army, you I mean, going right back all the, you know, Frank Sinatra and, and all the, uh, the USO tours and, and, and mm -hmm. during the Second World War as well. But I know for here in the U.K., we had very similar, you know, situations in the First and Second World War with musicians and bands would be sent over to these these places as well. But Obviously, this, when you didn't learn your, your craft as a musician in, um, in the army, I don't believe. So where did it all begin for you? Where did the music bug bite you? Oh, gosh. It's, it's, a, it's dangerous because singing is almost as natural to us as talking. Uh, and that's not just me. You know, that, and that's not just people who are talented. That's, you know, all of us, you know, children love singing. And so I, I have been kind of vocalizing and singing as long as I can remember. But um, when I was five, there was a baby, uh, baby grand upright piano that had been 
passed down through the generations and was in my home. And my parents were very open to letting me just bang around on it. <laughs> um, and that's and they didn't make me take lessons, which I think was actually quite valuable. Um, I kind of learned, you know, how I loved the feeling of music, not by rote, but by ear. And um, I, finding the relationships between those notes, it just really resonated in me. And then somewhere in, you know, my when I was around 10 or 11, I started playing cello because my father also played cello. And my grandmother was a huge Andrew Lloyd Webber fan. You know, I loved Fan of the Opera. I could recite the entire thing to you. <laughs> she was a uh, organist and pianist. And so she would accompany me and teach me new songs. And so I've always been kind of inundated um, with, you know, a musical lifestyle. And so I, I kind of picked up piano by ear and then I've always kind of just vocalized by ear. Cello was a little more formal, I had more lessons. And then when I was about 16, my grandfather pulled out some old bass guitar that my dad, of course, never admitted to playing before that time. And he said, your dad used to play bass when he was at Princeton. He started this band and he played bass guitar. And so he pulled out this old 70s Fender copy. I mean, it wasn't even, you know, anything remarkable. And I just started playing along with the radio. And, you know, that was around the time when, like, No Doubt was coming up and Nirvana and Sublime and, and all of these really raw, organic rock songs. You know, Bush was even kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. That- so, um, you know, and that's kind of where I started finding the love for rock music. And, and when did the, the, the writing part begin? Obviously, I know you're, you're a songwriter as well. Where, w- at what point did you start writing those kind of first uh, kind of tentative songs? It's kind of funny because a lot of songwriters sometimes are poets first um, and learn that art of meter and lyric early on. And I actually didn't. I didn't understand, um, I don't think enough about music to really have that desire. So after I joined the military and I was playing, you know, I was playing in a salsa band, I was playing jazz music, I was playing pop music. I mean, and I even was playing some uh, traditional band music as well, learning how to play marching bass drum, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which was quite entertaining. Um, And... I think at that point, I realized just how much of a spread really existed in music and how much room for creative motion there was. And so it was probably about 10 years ago or so um, when I decided that I wanted to start creating my own and, and just see what would happen if I applied all of these facets of these different cultures and different styles of music you know, what would happen if I combined that exposure into my own art? And uh, it's it's been incredible. I love writing songs now. So when you were first starting to write, was it was the subject matter very much, you know, the usual subject matter of love and loss? Or, 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 or were you also, because as you became into the military as well, you were obviously seeing things, um, uh, good and bad, about the human condition that... Were they influencing your your songwriting as well, or did you tend to just almost kind of separate that part of your life out when it came to the songs? I think I really i I wanted to represent, I, and that's something that has been consistent in my songwriting. And, and this is before I was ever doing it for the army at all. Um, I, I always wanted to represent just that human, you know, the growth, the conflict, the the experience, um, kind of keeping a mindfulness about, you know, everyday life. And so some of the subjects were a little more typical. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Love and, you know, friendship and betrayal and anger and angst and impatience, you know. Um, There is one song of mine, though, that is um, very poignantly about service. And I actually, I, I think it's an amazing coincidence that we're talking on Memorial Day because the song is called Where I Stand. And um, my favorite concept as far as the lyrical content and the message I'm trying to say with that song is, you know, how the lyric is, um, live the gift they gave, we don't expect a thing. And um, just that idea that, you know, service is something that you do to be uh, a piece of betterment of the whole. And it's not so that we can get a military discount at Hot Topic. It's, <laughs> it's so, you know, we can 
live free and um, and we support the people through that service. And so, you know, that was probably um, the only song that I wrote that was really about my service directly. But I do think that being exposed to as many different cultures as I have been, um, whether it's people in the military or the places that I've traveled, I've been to Korea, I've been, I was even to Cuba before they opened it back up. Um, and I've spent a lot of time in the Middle East as well. And I think kind of understanding, you know, what, what people need and, and want to see and, you know, how all our hopes and dreams can fall in such similar categories of aspiration, regardless of where we're from. Um, I think that's really what drove me to, to write most of the songs that I have. A, qu- a question I always ask my guests as well is about their, their biggest strengths and weaknesses as, as, mm. as a creative person. And I was interested, you know, the quote that I mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, in the army, you, you learn to acknowledge your weaknesses so that it could be strengthened as well. So I, I'd be interested, can I get your take, what do you feel now as a, as a creative person? What are your, your strengths and weaknesses? And, and for the, how has the work that you have done over the past couple of years um, uh, kind of led you to maybe strengthen those weaknesses that you first had? Mm. I think, you know, it's it's funny because I was listening to your podcast uh, from a couple of times ago and I was listening to Victor Wooten. Oh, yeah, great. Um, no, no, who, no, no, another Tennessean, actually, as well. Yeah, another Nashvilleian, another bass player. Um, yeah. And I, I actually met him when he was on tour going through Baltimore in 2008 or so. And he just is a very zen human being. And um, so his answer to that question was actually quite zen as well. So people should go listen to that. But <laughs> um, I, I think, you know... It, I really liked his answer because he talked very much about um, almost not interpreting your weaknesses as weaknesses and just viewing them as places to kind of learn about yourself. Um, So, you know, I, and I view things the same way. I mean, I think I'm very happy with kind of the, the strength that I've developed um, in work ethic and in perseverance as a soldier. I think, um, you know, you obviously learn to work very hard and to do things that you're not ultimately comfortable yeah. <laughs> with, uh, but that you learn to push through. I think, you know, as any independent creative person or even a creative person in a corporate environment, um, you know, I, I think that it's, it can be very challenging to stay creative and um, continue to desire to be creative when you feel stifled. Um, and that that is something that we all have to push through uh, and i think that the it, it's ironic but the military has actually helped me figure out how to persevere and to hold on to that creativity when the world seems black and white around me um so that yeah. that, that kind of final push just when it's sometimes when in those kind of darkest hours we just kind of wondering how in the hell do I get out of this situation? Or, you know, this, this lyric, I just can't finish this thing off or, or something that's happening in your career, that kind of gives you, um, I suppose, like the, uh, the word is grit, you know, in, yeah. in what, you, what you're, you're doing as well. It kind of gives you that thing, willing to kind of push through as well, where maybe other people would have just, okay, given up at that point. Most definitely. I mean, and I think everybody kind of has their own places where they found it. But for me, working, working in the military and, you know, having to push through, you know, my two mile run and because I was trying to get it faster this time, or, you know, I could do one more push up. you know, um, the, it's funny how, you know, basic that seems, but it, it really does kind of over time as you push yourself, um, to pass through barriers that you think are hard, they're actually soft. And uh, I think you, know, you can do the same thing with your creative advances. And can you tell us about a time when you worked on on something and you you gave it your all, you gave it your heart and your soul, but for whatever reason it just didn't work out like you'd hoped? And and more importantly, what were the lessons that you took away from the experience? Oh, all the time. I mean, I I think uh, especially as a musician, you know, sometimes it can be very – and I think any artist really, you know, you're putting art on a page or in a song and, and you're really burying your soul. You know, if you're doing it in a truly creative fashion, now if you're doing it in a way where you're selling great things, then that's awesome and maybe it's not as vulnerable. But I think for most creative people, it's a very vulnerable process. And so it's funny how even just one one lick of negative uh, feedback, uh, especially if it's not constructive and it's just, you know, negative, that can be very hard. And especially in an era of social media, 
I spend a lot of time on Twitter. I spend most of my time on Twitter talking to uh, fans and other musicians and industry people and um, or just, you know, people going along the grind like I am. And so it, you can be very exposed in that platform. And I think for me, um, you know, when I released, um, I, I released one of my songs. I played it live on the Vans Warped Tour kickoff in Orlando earlier this year, um, kind of as a preview to Warp Tour this summer. And I, uh, I, you know, we went on stage. We did our thing. It was live broadcast via YouTube. And I looked on Twitter and there were, you know, some people saying like, what is this crap? (laughs) And I was like, wow. And, you know, it's funny because you have to take it in perspective. Um, I think the most important thing about evaluating feedback, especially as a creative person and as someone who desires to grow, you definitely don't want to take everything too personally. But at the same time, I think you need to evaluate when you start hearing the same thing multiple times. Um, it's true that many people on social media are speaking without a filter or maybe they don't even have the knowledge to state what they are. But, um, you know, it's, I think the most important part for me of being creative is finding a connection with people like me. And so if there's ever a time when I'm not connecting, that, that always feels like a failure. Um, but instead I've tried to kind of embrace that and, you know, be like, okay, that path didn't work. That's okay. I'm going to go this way and, and see how this works out. And I think that's all you really can do. And on social media, do you, do you sometimes find that maybe people are a little bit m- more aggressive or a bit more attacking towards what you're doing? First of all, because you have this, the relationship with, with, with the, uh, the U.S. Army, but also you're a woman as well. And, and there's, the sec- there's a sexism thing that obviously goes on, that seems to go on all the time. And I think, especially for female artists, uh, have a, they really get hit with it. I think it's it's kind of remarkable how you know how many categories we can file a person into and then you know categorically have some kind of criticism for them based on that you know that category of person they are and it's funny around this time last year um, I was I was I played Vans Warped Tour last year around the same time that that was announced I was also on an interview. Um, on CNN with Carol Costello, and she was asking me a lot about being a woman in service and um, the challenges and, uh, you know, what what the environment was like from my perspective. And uh, these things all kind of came out at the same time. And so Vans Warped Tour on their social media said, oh, you know, Corinne Campbell, she's a soldier, she's going to be playing and that community was like, why is the army involved with a punk tour? <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of criti- There was a lot of positive stuff too, but there was a lot of criticism about why is a soldier or why is the army involved in Warp Tour? And why, why should that be, you know, so she's a soldier, great. Why should we care? And then on the other side, where the CNN stuff came out, you know, it was kind of the other direction where, you know, it was... You know, everything, everything is ignorant from people saying I look like a lesbian, which I don't even know why that would be a, a negative thing, to, <laughs> you know, to, um, you know why, why was the army wasting money on music? I mean, it, it was just, it's, it's incredible if you let that negative stuff come around, like how, how loud it will be, mm. you know? Um, and so I, I think that there's kind of a place to criticize anyone for anything. And I... I have started to view that as, you know, I, I, for a while I tried to just shut it out and not pay attention to it. And now I, I pay attention to it because I think it's important to understand, you know, what people don't understand and be able to respond to it intelligently. And if you're too emotional about it, um, you may not be able, that person may be won over by your reaction. And so what I started doing is I started going in to a lot, especially on Facebook, I went in on a lot of those comments. And when they were especially belligerent, I didn't answer. But when they seemed to express a genuine concern, I responded to them and invited them, you know, for those who were criticizing why I was a soldier doing music, I I would say, you know, go listen to it. Um, You know, I'd love to hear more about what you think. And I would try to engage those people because I think whatever the criticisms are and and whatever piece of who you are they're trying to get down on, uh, as soon as you make yourself a real person, um, they, they may want to understand more. Now, some, some just won't. But I think that if you're trying to better the world, 
you you have to engage those people and show them that they're incorrect and not through aggression but through reasonability. And what about when you're backstage with with the so maybe there's, there's, there's folks out there in, in the audience who are not happy for whatever reason. But when you're backstage with other bands and you're mm-hmm. chat, you're talking to other other bands and, and other musicians, um, what's the what's their perspective on you know what uh, first of all what a, a musician in the military is like, and then uh, is there any kind of differences you've noticed between you know the, the life of a of a, uh, a musician that's in maybe in the military and one play, the military bands or one of the groups and a civilian musician that's that's doing it, or the, are the things that, that are very similar. Mm-hmm. Well, I, you know, I, I got to admit, the most drastic difference between me and a lot, a lot of the artists I love is that I don't get to dye my hair in unnatural color. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to dye my hair purple. And uh, obviously, in the Army, that's not allowed. Um, you know, I, I think that um, especially, well, and I am kind of, you know, I'm exposed to more of an alternative scene and rock music. So a lot of those artists have a lot of tattoos and, uh, in places that the army would not authorize and, um, they dress very differently and they have a very kind of alternative piercing style sometimes. And, um, so those are the kinds of things that, you know, they can immediately see that I'm different for those reasons. Um, and, I find that generally there is some skepticism coming from some of these other artists. Sometimes they're, they're just, you know, quite frankly, most of the bands that I've toured with who are from other countries are fascinated by it from the get. And um, they're not skeptical at all. And then the more American bands are actually skeptical, which surpri- it surprises me a little, I guess. I don't know why. But, um, you know, in the end, I think that, I've been generally surprised about how accepting they are once they hear the music. And for me, I mean, that's just, that's the pinnacle for me is when they hear the musicianship, they hear the music, they hear how real and authentic it is and, you know, how I'm not just a billboard for the army (laughs) in my music. Um, And they see how close and real it is to me, just like their music is close and real to them. Um, So, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful to see that transition. And I have to say that I've never been approached by a band that says like, Oh, what, you know, what is this craziness? And I hate that you're in the army. I know that there are some activist bands, um, out there who, you know, may have something interesting to say, but they've never approached me. So, um, everyone that we talked to has always been very positive. And I think for, oh, I'm sorry. I think for us, you know, as far as differing from civilian musicians, we are very comfortable <laughs> because we're salaried <laughs> um, and we have health insurance. Now, and- I, I, I can hear a lot of musicians, American musicians listening to it just now saying, actually, that's uh, that's uh, that's a the one that bonuses because obviously health insurance in America is is a uh, is a big thing. And so you, you have this this ongoing and the Veterans Associate, um, Association Healthcare as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it. You can't really beat that. I mean, there we are. You know, whether you know we're at an E five sergeant level or whether we're higher up than that. I mean, we're making anywhere from you know thirty two to fifty thousand dollars base pay, um, plus all the benefits that come with that, which includes health insurance. And so, you know, I mean, not to get into the numbers, but that's a that's a pretty significant salary for someone who's playing music for a living. And um, compared to a lot of bands who have to have another job sure. um, between tours and try to sustain their merchandising and all of that. So um, the opportunity that I have right now is just incredibly remarkable. And it is unique. It, it is different from the standard military band uh, because I'm you know allowed to do the music that I wrote myself. Um, but there are... You know, there are many, many musicians across the country for multiple branches of service, and they're all kind of contributing their talent to the betterment of the whole and at the same time able to sustain a, a healthy lifestyle with it. And in this creative journey, this, this life you've had, can you tell us about any insights or, or light bulb moments, moments where you've gone, OK, this is maybe the direction I need to be going with my music or, or my life or, or a key distinction that you've made along the way? I think it's always it always comes from the people I meet. Um, I I've learned so much about myself in this job and learned so much about the people around me. And 
especially if you are exposed to a lot of mainstream media, it can be very difficult to see the good in people. Um, and I, I have been very inspired by the people I've met who have been very good and kind. And you know, one thing that's especially interesting about my function versus what many bands are doing is that we are largely, during the school year, we tour to high schools. Um, and we've been in all 48 of the continental United States in this past year and played at high schools in every single one of them. And no matter where I go, these teenagers who are passionate about the music they love, they may not like the kind of music that I write. Uh, they have no idea who I am. You know, I, I'm not necessarily famous as far as they're concerned, although it is fun when it, we find fans who are already fans and then we show up at their school. <laughs> they love that. But um, there's a lot of them who don't know who I am. And I have 40 minutes to, you know, because school time is very precious. And so I have 40 minutes to prove to them that I'm someone who is worth their time. And uh, it's amazing how many of them really give me a very fair shot at doing that. Uh, they're very open and they want to hear what I have to say. And so I think that really inspires creativity when you realize that there are a lot more people out there open to hearing what you have to say or who feel that what you have to say resonates for them in a way that's very meaningful. And there are fans that, you know, there are kids that I've played for you know, three years ago and now they're in college and they're asking me, you know, they want to go into graphic design and they, you know, they want to talk to someone about their life and their choices who isn't their parents. <laughs> And then when you when you're talking to these students, obviously you're you're giving the benefit of, of your advice, the, the you know the years the, the, that you have had and kind of coming up uh, in this path and this this life you've had. But what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received about living a living a creative life and, and doing the work that you do? I think that the best advice I've received has been about mindfulness. I I, have, I am regularly trying to incorporate more uh, meditation or thoughtfulness or just being very present. In um, especially when I'm trying to be creative, because I think in those moments you are actually kind of open to the world influencing what you're creating, and and that's I think the whole point of being creative is allowing whatever is happening in your world to culminate into some cool new presentation that you can share with other people. Um, so I mean that's most definitely. The, the best advice. My second best piece of advice was from my grandfather, which was never pass up an opportunity to use the bathroom. <laughs> That's a good, two good <laughs> pieces of advice. And on the mind, mm -hmm. and the mindfulness one, is there any, you know, someone, maybe someone listening to the show just now who's, you know, you can hear about all this mindfulness meditation thing, but like, what, what is it? Is, is there any like fir good first place for them to start, to start learning about mindfulness? Or is there any way that you found was particularly useful for you to get into learn about mindfulness? Oh, podcasts galore. I mean, I, I've become a podcast addict as of late. And I, it's amazing just listening to different people. And, you know, I have to say, like, I'm so excited that I'm, I might now be one of those people that someone hears and is inspired Absolutely. by. Because I spend, I spend so much time listening to other people um, on podcasts. And um, there's a, there's an app I use called Headspace that I like very much. I use the same um, app. It's a great app. Oh, see, I, I think it'd be funny because the narrator has a very similar accent to you. Yeah, he's, he's from <laughs> London, actually. In fact, I, right. I, this week, I just got an email this week inviting me to the the, mind, the, the Headspace HQ for something. And I would uh, love to have gone, but I wasn't able to, I didn't have, uh, didn't have any free time to go to it. But that's a great app, really great, yeah. great app. I, I love it. I think it really, it takes you through the baby steps of, you know, being mindful. And then it, you do the first 10 and then you can kind of dive into specific categories. But I, I think meditation is just so valuable. Um, you know, I, that and like a white noise machine while I sleep. Those are the two things that, that make my brain slow down enough to be creative and not be stressed about every other thing on the planet. And while well, we're speaking about apps and things, do you have a, an online resource or, a, or an app like Evernote or, uh, or you mentioned um, Headspace well, that you absolutely love? I use a lot of Evernote um, because I I actually have another app on my iPad called Penultimate, oh, that, yeah. and so I can just draw and I I've got the Apple Pencil and I so I can just sketch 
in lyrics or, you know, little meters or even sometimes I draw, which are, they're horrendous, but <laughs> sometimes I draw kind of ideas for the feeling of the music that I want. Um, you know, so, and then those go to Evernote and it's all in one place. And so I, I'd say that I use those a lot. And then just the typical Apple notes program when I'm writing lyrics, I, um, I, I, I always feel a little bit better when I get those lyrics written out and kind of can see them as something it's like, okay, that exists now. I can do something with it. It's not stuck in my head. Um, but yeah, I am always looking for new apps. My phone has way too many apps on it. (laughs) <laughs> because I'm always just trying to find that perfect one, uh, especially being on social media and creating memes and having photo collages and all the madness. You know, one app that I really recommend, though, is called One Second Every Day. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a, uh, a video app where basically you just take videos, you know, throughout your days or every other day, whatever you remember of something that kind of, you know, represents the day to you. And sometimes it can be something very high energy or very exciting. And sometimes it can just be sitting on your front porch. Mine today was sitting on my front porch with all the flags that everyone has out for Memorial Day and just blowing softly in the wind. But those videos then culminate and you can do it every two months, every year. Um, But you put one second per day and it just kind of ticks through. And when you've done that for a month straight, it, you know, kind of, I don't know. It helps my memory. It helps me value what I've been doing in life and, sure. you know, kind of think about it a little. Well, we'll definitely put that on the show and people to go to jamestaylor.me and just uh, type in uh, Karen Campbell in there you're, and you get links to all these as well. Is there um, a record and a book that you would recommend that our listeners check out? Oh, book is easily The Phantom Tollbooth. And I, it was written for like eight or nine year olds. Are you familiar? No, I've never heard of this one. Oh my goodness! It it was it's a book that's you know probably a first or second grade reading level, um, but both my brother and I have read it at least yearly since we were the age where we were supposed to uh, be able to read it. And it, it's it's an incredible um, it's an incredible representation of it's a little boy who is bored and. His life is just so a dull drum and, you know, the world is not stimulating him far enough. And so all of a sudden this box arrives and inside is this little toll booth and you're supposed to put it together and there's a little pretend map and there's a little car and little toll coins and uh, he constructs it and he goes on an amazing adventure and, you know, through a world of numbers and maps and letters and you know, war and peace and silence and, you know, din. And it's just, it's an amazing, um, I think at any point in your life, it kind of sheds a little more perspective on how people relate to each other, the things that we are silly about. And <laughs> Very it's a, cool. It's a really cool book. That's great. So that's called The Phantom Tobus. And what, what would the album be? Oh, there's so many. There's so many. Um, actually, I have to say, you know, one thing, even though I'm a rock artist, I am obsessed with this album called Hush, um, that is Yo-Yo Ma and Bobby McFerrin. And maybe because I'm a former cellist and a vocalist, that's why, um, but it's called Hush. And so basically it's a collection of duets between Bobby McFerrin and Yo-Yo Ma. And some of them are classical and in inspiration and some of them are original and silly and it really shows the personality of two individuals that I just find so musically inspiring and uh, also shows their incredible talent and so I would de- definitely recommend Hush. Two great artists, that's, that's great, definitely one we'll put on the show notes as well. Um, now just before we kind of come up to the final question, I wanted to ask you, you're, you're obviously kind of coming to the end of your, um, your service I believe as well and then you're making plans to go and the, the next chapter in your life. So what, what does the next chapter of your life look like uh, in terms of what you plan on doing musically? Oh, the next chapter is so undefined and I, I'm so excited about it. I, I have kind of a, a slather of things that I'm throwing at the wall and seeing what sticks and, and you know, what I feel most inspired by. I, 
One thing I am working on is um, launching my own business, which is in January. I'll probably start that, but um, helping other independent artists, whether it's through graphic design or recording or um, you know social media management or content construction, you know all of these things that an independent artist needs to stay independent. I think record labels have become kind of this holy grail that is just unnecessary and independent artists um, make the most of their own money <laughs> and I also have that power to present their art the way they want. And so um, it's it's a business that will also be a partnership of many uh, many companies or individuals who have normally done it at a label level, um, but they're willing to go in a much more reasonable price range and offer those services a la carte to independent artists. And I'm, I'm very excited about that because I think it opens up professional services to uh, great musicians who may not otherwise be able to afford it. Nice. Um, very yeah. interesting. And, and what about on, on the musical side, on, on the actual playing side as well? Do you have a new album in the work? Obviously, you've got this, you, we've got this uh, warped tour that you're about to um, kind of go on the road for as well. And is, mm-hmm. is there a new album coming out with that or is a new album kind of planned at the end of that? Yes. So actually, um, the act that I have, the new project that I'm in is called Dash 10. And um, it's kind of a a throwback to a basic user manual for a piece of equipment in the military is called the Dash 10 manual. And so, and that's actually a dash and a 10, but this is actually Dash 10 completely spelled out. And um, so that is the band that I'll be touring with on Warp Tour. And we just released a debut album that was out May 21st and it's streamable pretty much everywhere. Um, Spotify, Rhapsody, all those. And um, we have a new single coming out on June 8th, which is premiering exclusively through the Warp Tour channels. And then we have another album already in the works that'll be released around this time next year. So um, my, my current exit of service is April 13th, 2017. And I'm not retiring. <laughs> I'm not old enough to retire. <laughs> It's been a great ride, but it, it kind of got to the point where I was like, you know, I, I think it's it's been wonderful. I think I served my purpose. I think the Army served its purpose to me, and now I want to move on and kind of do my own thing. And so uh, I plan to get that album released in May of 17 and go out on tour and see what new things arise. Good. So final question for you, which kind of ties into this, because um, you're making this obviously this fresh start, this opening this new chapter. Let's imagine if you woke up tomorrow morning and had to start from scratch. So you have all the tools of your trade, you've got the skills, the chops you have as a musician, all, this, all the you know, social media knowledge that you've acquired as well. But no one knows who you are. You know, have no contacts. You have to start again. How would you restart things? Oh, Wow. <laughs> trying to stump me James um you know I I think the same way I started in the first place you know you you put you put a note down on paper and write a lyric to it and put it out I mean I think you know with the tools that are available now because I started as an artist in around 2008 and so with the tools that are available now you know you don't have to rely on MySpace (laughs) and so um you know SoundCloud is somewhere like music would be up I'd be, you know, putting things out on YouTube. I'd be doing um, and performing live just as much as I could. So I think as a creative person, especially if you have to start from scratch, which in in some elements I will be doing that when I get out of the Army because I've had this other platform that, you know, I I won't necessarily have the same uh, support as I did. And um, you just have to create and create and create and find what is your most resonating, powerful piece of art, and then share it and share it and share it. And so for artists, that would be, you know, attempting to show your art wherever you can. And for musicians, that'd be get your music played wherever you can. Play live as much as you can. You know, build yourself as an artist, as a musician, as a creator, and share that. And I think... If you're doing it in a way that's authentic and genuine to you, you will be successful. Great. Well, some great advice there. Thank you so much for coming on on the show today. Uh, What's the best way that people can connect with you, uh, find out all these these tour dates, the new album, and all the other projects you've got happening? Well, the best way to connect with me personally, uh, my handle on everything from Snapchat to Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, 
Pinterest, SoundCloud. I mean, I'm everywhere online um, is Corinne Campbell, all one word. And um, CorinneCampbell.com is my website. And the new project that I'm involved in is called Dash 10. And our username on everything, again, is Dash 10 Music. And um, that's that's probably going to be the best way to find me as of now. But I, I respond to all messages myself. I love connecting with people from all over the world on all kinds of subjects, <laughs> from makeup to the army <laughs> to everything. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty Googleable. So just, uh, you know, find me because I'd love to hear from you. Well, I wish you all the best now with uh, as you start to... F- close one chapter and open up the new ch- this new chapter in your life and in in your music and your your creative life thank you so much for coming on the show all the best oh thank you for having me james hey james taylor here again and if you're interested in living a more creative life then i'd love to invite you to join me as i share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use i put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to james taylor.me that's james taylor dot me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.